Chapter 5, Stephen King Fairy Tale. Shopping, My Father's Pipe, A Call from Mr. Bowditch, The Flower Canister. We've got some art there. Fabulous. We went to the hardware store to get a safety bar installation kit and then to the pet pantry where there was also a walk-in veterinary. I got heartworm chewables and carprofen for radar's arthritis. That stuff is supposed to be by prescription only, but when I explained the situation, the lady gave it to me, only specifying that the meds had to be a cash deal. She said Mr. Bowditch bought all of Radar stuff there, paying extra for delivery. Dad used his credit card for the safety bar kit. I used my own money for the pills. Our last stop was the drugstore, where I bought a urinal with a long neck, a bedpan, the disinfectant I was supposed to use for the pin care, and two spray bottles of heavy-duty window cleaner. I paid for that stuff too, but not cash. I had a $250 limit on my visa, but wasn't worried the card would be refused. I was never what you'd call a shop-till-you-drop type. On the ride home, I kept expecting Dad to talk to me about this commitment I'd made, which was, after all, a pretty big deal for a kid of 17. He didn't, though. Just listened to the classic rock on the radio and sometimes sang along. I found out soon enough that he was just deciding what he wanted to say. I walked up to Mr. Bowditch's house where I was greeted by Radar. I put her meds on the counter and then peeked into the bathroom. I thought the tight quarters would actually be helpful when it came to installing the safety bars and for him using them, but that was tomorrow's job. I'd seen a pile of clean rags on the shelf over the washing machine in the cellar. I went down and grabbed a double handful. It was a pretty spring day and my initial idea had been to spend it outdoors, putting the fence to rights, but I decided that the windows should come first so the stink of the cleanser would be out of the house when Mr. Bowditch came back. It also gave me an excuse to tour the place. In addition to the kitchen, pantry, and living room, the places where he actually lived, there was a dining room with a long table covered with a dust cloth. There were no chairs, which made it look pretty empty. There was also a room meant to be a study or a library or a combination of the two. I saw with real dismay that the ceiling had leaked and some of the books had gotten wet. These were nice ones, too, expensive-looking and leather-bound, not like the careless stacks in the back hall. There were sets of Dickens, a set of Kipling, a set of Mark Twain, and a set of someone named Thackeray. I decided that when I had more time, I'd pull them from their shelves, spread them on the floor, and see if they could be saved. There was probably YouTube videos about how to do that. I pretty much lived by YouTube that spring. There were three bedrooms on the second floor, plus the linen closet, and another bigger bathroom. His bedroom was lined with more bookshelves, and there was a reading lamp on the side of the bed where he obviously slept. The books in here were mostly paperbacks, mysteries, science fiction, fantasy, and pulp horror going back to the 40s. Some looked really good, and I thought if things went well, went okay, I'd ask to borrow some. I guessed Thackeray would be, a he be heavy going, but the bride wore black, looked right up my street. The bodacious bride on the cover was wearing black all right, but not much of it. There were two books on his bed table, a paperback called Something Wicked This Way Comes by Ray Bradbury and a thick hardcover tune titled The Origins of Fantasy and Its Place in the World Matrix, Junigan Perspectives. On the cover was a funnel filling up with stars. One of the other bedrooms held a double bed that had been made up but was covered with a plastic sheet. The third was completely empty and smelled stale. If I'd been wearing hard shoes instead of sneaks, my footfalls would have made spooky hollow sounds in that one. Narrow stairs, psycho stars, I thought, looked up to the third floor. It wasn't an attic but was being used as one. There was plenty of furniture jumbled up in the three rooms, including six fancy chairs that were probably supposed to go with the dining room table, and the bed from the empty room, with its head laid lengthwise across it. There were a couple of bikes, one missing a wheel, dusty cartons of old magazines, and in the third and smallest room, a wooden box of what looked like carpentry tools from the time when talking pictures were new. On the side faded were the initials A.B., 
I picked out the drill thinking it would help with the safety bar installation, but it was frozen solid and no wonder. The roof had leaked in, that, in the corner where the tools had been left and the whole works, drill, two hammers, saw, a leveling, a leveling gadget with a bleary yellow bubble in the middle had gone to Rust City. Something needed to be done about the leaky roof, I thought, and before the next winter arrived or there would be structural damage if there hadn't been already. I started with the windows on the third floor because they were the dirtiest. Filthy, in fact. I could see I'd be changing the water in my bucket often, and of course the insides were only half the job. I knocked off for lunch, heating a can of chili on the elderly hot point. Should I let you lick the bowl, I asked Radar. She looked up at me with those big brown eyes of hers. I won't tell if you won't. I put it down and she went at it, and then I went back to the windows. By the time I finished, it was mid-afternoon. My fingers looked pruney, and my arms were tired from all the rubbing rubbing, but Windex and vinegar, a YouTube tip, really did make a difference. The house was filled with light. I like it, I said. Want to take a stroll down to my house and see what dad's up to? She barked that she did. Two, dad was waiting for me on the front porch. His pipe was on the rail along with the pouch of tobacco, which meant we would be having the talk after all, a serious one. There was a time when my dad smoked cigarettes. I don't remember how old I was when mom gave him the pipe for his birthday. It wasn't a fancy Sherlock Holmes job, but I think expensive. I do remember she'd been asking him to quit the cancer sticks and he kept promising vaguely, the way addicts do, that he would get around to it. The pipe did the trick. First he cut down on the butts and then let them go entirely, not long before mom crossed the goddamn bridge to get us a box of chicken. I like the smell of the three cells he got at the tobacconist downtown, but quite often there was nothing to smell because it kept going out. That might have been part of mom's master plan, but I'd never got a chance to ask her. Eventually the pipe went into the pipe rack on the mantle, at least until mom died. Then it came out again. I never saw him with another cigarette during his drinking years but the pipe was always with him at night while he watched those old movies, although he rarely lit it or even filled the bowl. He chewed hell out of the stem and the bit, though, and had to replace both. He took the pipe with him to AA meetings when he started going. There was no smoking there, so he'd chew on the stem. Sometimes, Lindy Franklin told me this, with the bowl upside down. Around the time of his second anniversary, the pipe went back into the rack on the mantel. I asked him about it once and he said, I'm two years sober, I think it's time to stop teething. But the pipe still came out once in a while. Before some of the big agent meetings in the Chicago office, if he had to make a presentation, always on the anniversary of my mom's death, and it was out now, complete with tobacco, which meant this was going to be a very serious talk. Radar climbed the porch, old lady style, pausing to inspect each step. When she finally made it, Dad scratched behind her ears. Who's a good girl? Radar made a whooping noise and lay down beside Dad's rocker. I took the other one. Did you get her started on the meds? Not yet. I'll sneak the heartworm, the heartworm and the arthritis pill into her supper. You didn't take the safety bar installation kit? That's for tomorrow. I'll read the instructions tonight. Also, the Home Care for Dummies pamphlet. I'll need to borrow your drill if it's okay. I found someone's toolboxes, initials A, B on it. Maybe it's his father's or his grandfather's. But everything in it is rusty. The roof leaks. You're welcome to use it. He reached for the pipe. The bowl was already loaded. He had some kitchen matches in his breast pocket, and he scratched one alight with a thumbnail, a skill that had fascinated me as a little kid. Still did, actually. You know I'd be happy to go up there with you and help out. No, that's okay. It's a pretty small bathroom and we'd just get in each other's way. But that's not really it, is it, Chip? How long had it been since he called me that? Five years? He held the lit match already halfway down the stick over the bowl and began sucking away. Also waiting for me to reply, of course, but I had nothing. Radar raised her head, smelled the fragrant tobacco smoke, and then put her snout back on the porch's boards. She looked pretty contented. <clears throat> he shook out the match. There's nothing up there you don't want me to see, is there? 
That made me think of Andy asking if there was a lot of stuffed animals and a spooky kick, Kit Kat clock that followed you with its eyes. I smiled. No, it's just a house. Kind of run down with a leaky roof. Something will have to be done about that eventually. He nodded and puffed his pipe. I talked to Lindy about this, this situation. I wasn't surprised. Lindy was his sponsor and dad was supposed to talk to and was supposed to talk about the things that bothered him. He says that maybe you have caretaker mentality from when I was boozing. God knows there were times when you did caretake me, young as you were, cleaned the house, did the dishes, got your own breakfast, and sometimes dinner. He paused. Those days are hard for me to remember and even harder to talk about. It's not that. Then what is it? I still didn't want to tell him I'd made a deal with God and had to keep my end of the bargain, but there was something else I could tell him, something he'd understand, and fortunately, it was true. You know how they talk in AA about maintaining an attitude of gratitude? He nodded. A grateful alcoholic doesn't get drunk. That's what they say. And I'm grateful you don't drink anymore. Maybe I don't tell you all the time, but I am. So why don't we say I'm trying to pay it forward and leave it at that? I said I did. Maybe when he's a little bit down the road from the accident, he nodded. That works. I love you, kiddo. I love you too. As long as you understand you're biting off a lot. You know that, right? I did, and I was aware I didn't know just how much. I thought it was good. If I really knew, I might lose heart. There's that other thing they say in your program about taking it a day at a time. He nodded. Okay, but spring vacation will be over fast. You have to keep up with your studies no matter how much time you feel you have to spend up there. I insist on it. Okay. He looked at the pipe. The thing's gone out. It always does. He put it on the porch rail and then leaned down and scratched the thick fur on the nape of Radar's neck. She raised her head, then lowered it again. This is a damn good dog. She is. Fell in love with her, didn't you? Well, yeah, I guess so. She's got a collar but no tag, which means Mr. Bowditch hasn't paid the dog tax. My guess is she's never been to the vet. Mine, too. Never been vaccinated for rabies, among other things. He paused and then said, Got a question I want you to think about. Very seriously, are we going to end up on the hook for this? The groceries, the dog meds, the safety bars? Don't forget the urinal, I added. Are we? Tell me what you think. He told me to keep track and he'd take care of the expenses. This was half an answer at best. I knew it and dad probably did too. On second thought, strike the probably. Not that we're exactly in the hole on this account. A couple of hundred dollars is all, but the hospital, do you know how much a week's stay in Arcadia costs? Plus the operations, of course, and all the aftercare. I didn't, but as an insurance adjuster, dad did. 80,000 minimum. There's no way we could be on the hook for that, could we? No, that's all him. I don't know what kind of insurance he has or if he has any. I checked with Lindy and he has nothing with Overland. Medicare, probably. Beyond that, who knows? He shifted in his seat. I checked him out a little bit. I hope that doesn't make you mad. It didn't and didn't surprise me. <clears throat> because checking people out was what my father did for a living, and I was curious, of course, what did you find? Almost nothing, which I would have said was impossible in this day and age. Well, he doesn't have a computer or even a cell phone, which lets out, which lets out Facebook and any other social media. I had an idea that Mr. Bowditch would have sneered at Facebook, even if he did have a computer. Facebook was Snoopy. You said there were initials on the toolbox you found. A.B., right? Right. That fits. The property at the top of the hill comprises an acre and a half, which is a hell of a good patch. It was purchased by someone named Adrian Bowditch in 1920. His grandfather? Maybe, but given how old he is, it could have been his father. Dad plucked his pipe off the porch rail, gave the bit a chew or two, and then put it back. How old is he anyway? Does he really not know? I wonder. I guess it's possible. When I saw him back in the old days, this was before he more or less holed up, he looked about 50. 
I'd give him a wave and sometimes he'd flip a hand back to me. Never spoke to him. Might have said hi, I guess, or passed a word about the weather if it was worth commenting on, but he wasn't the conversational type. Anyway, that would have made him roughly the right age for Vietnam, but I couldn't find any military record. So he didn't serve? Probably didn't serve. I probably could have found out more if I was still working for Oberlin, but I'm not and didn't ask Lindy. I get it. I established that he's got at least some money because property taxes are a matter of public record and the tab on number one sycamore in 2012 was 22000 and change. He pays that every year? It varies. The important part is he's paying it. And he was here when your mom and I moved in. Maybe I told you that. He would have been shelling out a lot less back in the day. Property taxes have gone up like everything else, but you're still looking, you're still talking six, six figures and all. It's a big lot. What did he do before he retired? I don't know. I really just met the guy and he was messed up when I did. We haven't had what you'd call a real heart to heart, although that was coming, I just didn't know it yet. I don't know either. I looked, but I didn't find, which it bears repeating, I would have said was impossible in this day and age. I've heard of people going off the grid, but usually in the wilds of Alaska with a cult that thinks the world's going to end, or in Montana like the Unabomber. You know who? A domestic terrorist, real name, Ted Kaczynski. You didn't happen to see any bomb-making equipment lying around Bodich's house, did you? Dad said this with a humorous lift of his brows, but I wasn't entirely sure he was joking. The most dangerous thing I've seen was the Skype. Oh, and the rusty hatchet in that toolbox on the third floor. Any pictures, like of his father and mother or him when he was young? Nope, the only one I saw was a photo of radar. It's on the table beside his easy chair in the living room. Hmm, Dad reached for his pipe. Changed his mind. We don't know where his money comes from, assuming it's st he still has some, and we don't know what he did for a living. Something from home, I assume, because he's an agoraphobe. That means, I know what it means. My guess, he's always tended in the direction, and it got worse as he got older. He pulled in. The lady across the street told me he used to walk radar at night. She pricked up her ears at the sound of her name. It seemed a little weird to me. Most people walk their dogs in the daytime, but less people on the streets at night, Dad said. Yeah, he sure doesn't seem like a high neighbor kind of guy. One other thing, Dad said, kind of weird, but he's kind of weird, wouldn't you say? I passed on the question and asked about the other thing. He's got a car. I don't know where it is, but he's got one. I found the registration online. It's a 1957 Studebaker. He gets a rate on the excess on the excise tax because it's registered as an antique, like the property tax he pays the excise every year. But that's a lot cheaper, 60 bucks or so. If he's got a car, you should be able to find his driver's license, Dad said. That will say how old he is. He smiled and shook his head. Good try, but no Illinois license has ever been issued in the name of Howard Bowditch. And of course, you don't have to have a driver's license to buy a car. It might not even run. Why pay the yearly tax on a car that doesn't? Here's a better one, Chip. Why pay the tax when he can't drive? What about Adrian Bowditch, the father or the grandfather? Maybe he had a license. Didn't think of that. I'll check. He paused. Are you sure you want to do this? I do. Then ask him about some of this stuff, because as far as I can find, he's almost not there. I said I would, and that seemed to close the discussion. I thought about mentioning the weird scuttering sound I'd heard in the shed, the shed with the heavy padlock on the door, even though there was supposedly nothing in it, but I didn't. The sound that had grown vague in my mind, and I had already enough to think about. Three. I was still thinking about those things as I took the plastic dust cover off the bed in the guest room where I'd sleep during the part of the spring vacation, or maybe even all of it. That bed was made up, but the sheets had a stale and musty smell. I took them off and put on fresh, fresh from the linen closet. How fresh, I didn't know, but they smelled better, and there was another set for the pull-out couch along with the comforter. I went downstairs. Radar was sitting at the front door waiting for me. I dropped the bedcloths on Mr. Bowditch's easy chair and saw that I'd have, I'd 
have to move in and the little table beside it to pull the couch out. When I moved the table, the drawer came partway open. I saw a litter of change, a harmonica, so old most of the chrome finish was worn away, and a bottle of carpropen. That made me happy because I hadn't liked to think of Mr. Do Bowditch ignoring his aging dog's discomfort, and it certainly explained why the pet pantry lady had been so willing to sell me more. What made me less happy was realizing the medication wasn't working very well. I fed her sticking a pill for the new bottle in her food, reasoning the stuff I just bought was fresher and maybe more powerful, than, then went back upstairs to get a pillow for the rollout. Radar was once more waiting at the foot of the stairs. Jesus, you gobbled that fast. Radar thumped her tail and moved just enough for me to get by her. I plumped the pillow a bit and then dropped it on the way, dropped it on what was now a bed in the middle of the living room. He might grouse about it, probably would, but I thought it would be okay. Pin care for a fixator, <clears throat> for his fixator looked easy enough, but I hoped there was something in home care for dummies about how to get him from the wheelchair, which I assumed he'd arrive in to the bed and back again. What else? What else? Stick the old Beth cloths from the guest room in the washer, but that could wait until tomorrow or even Monday. A phone. That was what else. He needed one close at hand. His landline was a white cordless that looked like it belonged in a TCM cops and robbers movie from the 1970s. The kind where all the guys have sideburns and the chicks have puffed up hair. I checked to make sure it worked and got a dial tone. I was putting it back in its charging crater when it rang in my hand. I yelped, startled, and dropped it. Radar barked. It's okay, girl, I said and picked it up. There was no button to accept the call. I was still looking for one when I heard Mr. Bowditch teeny in the distance. Hello? Are you there? Hello? So no accept button and no way to check who was calling. With a phone this old, you just had to take your chances. Hello, I said, it's Charlie. Mr. Bowditch, why is Radar barking? Because I yelled and dropped the phone. I was holding it in my hand when it rang. Startled you, didn't it? Startled you, did it? He didn't wait for an answer. I hoped you'd be there because it's Radar's dinner time. You fed her yet? You fed her, right? Right. She ate it in about three gulps. He gave a hoarse laugh. That's her, all right. She's gotten a little shaky on her pins, but her appetite's as good as ever. How are you feeling? My leg hurts like damn hell, even with the dope they're giving me, but they got me out of the bed today. Dragging that fixator around makes me feel like Jacob Marley. These are the chains I wore in life. He gave a hoarse laugh again. I was guessing he was pretty stoned. Read the book or seen the movie? Movie, every Christmas Eve on TCM. We watched a lot of TCM at my house. Don't know what that is. He wouldn't, of course. No Turner Classic movies on a TV equipped with nothing but, what had Mrs. Syllabus called them? Rabbit ears. I'm glad I got you. They're going to let me come home on Monday afternoon, and I need to talk to you first. Can you come to see me tomorrow? My roommate will be down in the lounge watching the baseball game, so we'll have some privacy. Sure, I made up the pull-out couch for you, also the bed upstairs for me. And, stop a minute, Charlie, a long pause, then, is keeping secrets in your repertoire or as well as making beds and feeding my dog? I thought about my father's drinking years, his lost years. I'd needed to look after myself a lot of the time back then, and I'd been angry, angry at my mother for dying the way she did, which was stupid because no way was it her fault, but you have to remember I was only seven when she got killed in that goddamn bridge. I loved my father, but I was angry at him too. Angry kids get into trouble, and I had, and I had a very able enabler in Birdie Bird. Birdie and I were okay when we were with Andy Chin because Andy was kind of a Boy Scout, but when we were on our own, we got up to some fairly outrageous shit. It was stuff that could have gotten us into a lot of trouble if we'd been caught. Some of it police-type trouble, but we never were. And my father never knew, never would, if I had my way. Did I really want to tell my dad that Birdie and I smeared dog shit on the windshield of our least favorite teacher's car? Just writing that down here where I promised to tell everything makes me cringe with shame. And that wasn't the worst of it. Charlie, are you still there? 
I'm here, and yeah, I can keep a secret. As long as you're not going to tell me you killed somebody and that there's a body in the shed. It was his turn to be silent, but I didn't have to ask if he was still there. I could hear his raspy breathing. Nothing like that, but these are big secrets. We'll talk tomorrow. You seem like a stray arrow. I hope to Christ I can write about, I'm right about that. We'll see. Now, how much am I in the bucket for you with your father? Do you mean how much have we spent? Not that much. The groceries were the most. A couple hundred and all, I guess. I saved the receipts. There's also your time. If you mean to help me, you need to be paid. How does 500 a week sound? I was flabbergasted. Mr. Bowditch, Howard, you don't have to pay me anything. I'm glad to. The workman is worthy of his hire. Book a loop. 500 a week, and if things work out, a year-end bonus, all right? Whatever he'd done in his working life, it had been digging ditches. It hadn't been digging ditches. He was comfortable with what Donald Trump calls the art of the deal, which meant he was comfortable overriding objections, and my objections were pretty weak. I'd made a promise to God, but if Mr. Bowditch wanted to pay me while I fulfilled that promise, I didn't see any conflict. Plus, as my father was always reminding me, I had college to think about. Charlie, do we have a deal? If it works out, I guess we do. Although, if he turned out to be a serial killer after all, I wasn't going to keep his secrets for $500 a week. For that, it would take at least a thousand. <laughs> Joke. Thank you. I wasn't expecting any. I know that, he, he interrupted. An ace interrupter was Mr. Howard Bowditch. In some ways, you're quite a charming young man, a straight arrow, as I said. I wondered if he'd still think so if he knew that one day while we were skipping school, the bird man and I found a cell phone in Highland Park and called in a bomb threat to Stevens Elementary. His idea, but I went along with it. There's a flower canister in the kitchen. You may have seen it. Not only had I seen it, he'd mentioned it to me, although he might have forgotten. He'd been in a lot of pain at the time. There was money in it, he said, and then he said it was empty. He said he forgot. Sure. Take $700 out of it. Five is your first week's wages and two for expenses to date. Are you sure? Yes. And if you think it's bribe money, maybe sweetening you up for some outrageous request, it's not. Services rendered, Charlie. Services rendered. And that you can be perfectly straight with your father about anything we might discuss in the future. No, I'm aware it's a lot to ask. As long as it's not crime, I said, and then amended and then amended it. Not a bad crime. Can you come to the hospital around three? Yes. Then I'll say good evening. Please give Radar a pat from the stupid old man who should have stayed off the ladder. He hung up. I gave Radar several pats on the head and a couple of long strokes. Nate to tell. She rolled over to have her belly rubbed. I was happy to oblige. Then I went into the kitchen and took the top off the flour canister. It was stuffed with money. There was a jumble of bills on top, mostly tens and twenties, a few fives and ones. I pulled them out and they made a fair sized heap on the counter. Below the loose bills were handed stacks of fifties and banded stacks of fifties and hundreds. The bands were stamped First Citizens Bank in purple ink. I pulled them out too and it took some wiggling because they were really crammed in there. Six banded stacks of fifties, ten to each. Five banded stacks of hundreds, also ten to each. Radar had come out into the kitchen and was sitting by her food dish looking at me with her ears pricked. Holy shit, girl, this is eight thousand dollars and that's not counting the stuff on top. I counted out seven hundred dollars from the loose bills neatened them, folded them over, and put the wad in my pocket where they made a where they made a bulge. It was at least ten times the amount of money I'd ever had on my person. I picked up the banded bundle, started to put them back into the canister, and then paused. There were three little pellets in the bottom, kind of reddish. I had seen one of those before in the medicine cabinet. I tipped them out and held them in the palm of my hand. I thought they were too heavy to be BBs, and I was right in what I was thinking. It might go a long way toward explaining the source of Mr. Bowditch's income. I thought they were gold. Four. I hadn't ridden my bike, and the walk down the hill to our house only took 10 or 12 minutes, but that night I made it last. I had 
thinking to do and a decision to make. As I walked, I kept touching the bulge in my pocket, making sure it was still there. I tell dad about Mr. Bogich's call and his offer of employment. I'd show him the cash, 200 for what we'd spent and 500 for me. I tell him to put the 400 of it in my college account, which just happened to be at First Citizens, and promise to put in another 400 every week that I was working for Mr. Bowditch, which might last right through the summer, or at least until football practice started in August. The question was whether or not I should tell him about how much money had been in the flower canister, and of course, those gold BBs, if they were gold. By the time I let myself into our house, I'd made my decision. I'd keep the fact of the 8,000 in the canister to myself and the BBs that weren't BBs, at least until I had my talk with Mr. Bowditch the next day. Hey, Charlie, my father called from the living room. Dog okay? She's fine. Good to know. Grab yourself a Sprite and grab a chair. Rear windows on TCM. I grabbed a Sprite, came in, and muted the TV. I've got something to tell you. What could be more important than James Stewart and Grace Kelly? How about this? I took the wad of money from my pocket and dropped it onto the coffee table. I expected surprise, caution, and worry. What I got was interest and amusement. Dad thought Mr. Bowditch hiding money in one of his kitchen canisters fit right in with what he called the agoraphobe's hoarding mentality. I told him about the hall of old reading matter, not to mention the old TV and the elderly kitchen appliances. Was there more in there? Some, I said, which wasn't a lie. Dad nodded. Did you check the other canisters? There might be a few hundred in with the sugar. He was smiling. Nope. He took the 200, a little more than we actually spent, but he'd probably need other stuff. Want me to deposit 400 of yours? Sure. Good call. In one way, he's getting you cheap, at least for the first week. I think a full-time home helper would get more. On the other hand, you'll be earning while you learn, and you'll only be spending nights up there during your spring vacation. He turned to look at me squarely. Are we clear on that? Totally, I said. Okay, good. Bowditch, raffling money, makes me a little uneasy only because we don't know where it came from, but I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. I like that he trusts you, and I like that you're willing to take this on. You thought you'd be doing it for free, didn't you? Yeah, I did. You're a good kid, Charlie. Not sure what I did to deserve you, considering what I was holding back, not just about Mr. Bowditch, but some of that shit I'd pulled with Bertie. That made me a little ashamed. Lying in the bed that night, I imagined Mr. Bowditch having a gold mine in his locked shed, maybe with a bunch of dwarfs to work it. Dwarfs with names like Sleepy and Grumpy. That made me smile. I had no idea that whatever was in that shed might be the big secret he wanted to tell, tell me about, but I was wrong. I didn't find out about the shed until later.